Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the final experts lecture. And I can see people are still logging on and they're from all over. Wow, cool. Chicago and Western Massachusetts are the last two I just saw. Anyway, um, I would just like to welcome you all. My name is Andrea Nandoskar. I'm the education program manager with Historic Hawaii Foundation. And really want to thank you. Many of you are repeat um, attendees from earlier lectures. And I want to thank you for joining us. This is the sixth and final lecture today for the 36th Annual Experts Historic Preservation Lecture Series. I want to give a huge mahalo to our event partner, Dr. Ralph Kam. He's the curator and coordinator of the series. And Dr. Cam is a lecturer with the Historic Preservation Graduate Certificate Program, which has moved over to the School of Architecture at UH Manoa. And we'll have something about that in our newsletter, our print newsletter for those who are members. Um, HHF is pleased to co-sponsor this series. And this year's theme is Historic Cemeteries. We are live streaming right now on Facebook and YouTube, the HHF platforms for those. And you can view immediately afterward on both of those platforms and share the lecture as well as watch it once again, if you'd like to from the recording. If you have questions during the lecture, please type them into the chat and we will have time at the end and go through as many as we can. Um, Oh, the final thing is if we do have a survey and thanks to everyone who has attended previously and is um, responding to the survey, it's really helpful for us. And we really appreciate your taking just a couple of minutes to do so when you log off today. And for anyone who's new to Historic Hawaii Foundation, we are a statewide nonprofit and we help people save historic places. These are sites from the many different layers of history here in Hawaii. They're historic built and cultural sites. And we do this through education, advocacy, assistance, and protection of and for historic places. I'd now like to warmly welcome Dr. Ralph Kemp, who will introduce today's speaker. And I hope you enjoy the lecture. Mahalo. You're on mute, Ralph. Dr. Kemp. No, we are indeed fortunate today to have with us uh, Liz Sargent. She's a fellow with the American Society of Landscape Architects. And she is a historical landscape architect and landscape historian who has been working for more than 30 years on a variety of projects related to historic properties and cultural landscapes. She is a principal of her own firm, Liz Sargent, HLA, a landscape architecture and preservation planning firm based in Charlottesville, Virginia. She holds a Bachelor of Arts in Botany and American History from Connecticut College and a Master of Landscape Architecture from the University of Virginia. Liz is active in several historic preservation related organizations, serves as an advisor to community led projects, conducts peer review, lectures at university programs, and presents papers and case studies at professional conferences. So you can see that we are indeed very, very fortunate to have her talking today. She is currently writing a book about her work in cultural landscapes and how it has shaped her worldview. Liz frequently travels to historic sites and national parks throughout the United States to study their cultural and environmental history and to develop landscape design and plans that help visitors learn about and experience the history. Liz's clients have ranged from the National Park Service to the National Trust for Historic Preservation, colleges and universities, and nonprofit organizations. Some of the projects Liz has worked on have included cultural landscapes associated with national park tourism at Yellowstone and Yosemite National Parks, ecological sites such as the Everglades National Park and Tallgrass Prairie 
National Preserve and sites of Native American heritage, such as Sankawa and Angel Mounds. In 2020, she worked with a team of preservation professionals to complete a cultural landscape report for the Kalaupapa Kalavau settlements on Molokai. The project expanded partway through to include preparation of a cemetery management plan for the numerous burial sites located within the settlements. It is this project that is the focus of today's talk. And again, we welcome Liz Sargent uh, to this talk. Thank you so much, Ralph. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, thank you for coming today. I'm going to um, talk a lot about uh, Kalawa Papa and Kalawao um, within the framework of this uh, cemeteries. Sorry, I can't get it to advance. Uh, let's see. There we go. Um, and so here are the components of the talk today. I will provide a, an introduction. Then I will give you an overview of what the Kalawapapa and Kalawao settlements um, are comprised of. Then talk a little bit about the historical overview of how they came to be um, and how they've evolved over time. And then center on um, the cemeteries themselves and then talk a little bit about the preservation issues and needs that we encountered when we visited the site. And then some of our findings and recommendations for how uh, the National Park Service can address some of these preservation issues and needs, and then open up the conversation to you all for questions and discussion. Um, and repeating a little bit of what Ralph um, spoke about in the introduction, um, I am, a historical landscape architect. My work takes me all over the United States and sometimes to other countries to work on historic landscapes. I am trained as a landscape architect, which means that I design features and systems to accommodate people within the landscape in a variety of ways. But as a historical landscape architect, my work more specifically deals with how to accommodate change within a place that merits spe um, special protection for its historical associations and features. We use background research to learn about the evolution of a place and incorporate that knowledge into the design of features and management protocols. It was in this capacity a few years ago that I became involved in a project for the National Park Service at Kalawa Papa. Our work entailed preparation of a cultural landscape report which is a type of study that traces the historical evolution of landscapes and records their current condition in order to help guide wise stewardship of historic landscape features into the future. As part of a larger team, I worked on an overall study of the peninsula landscape and its history as a place where patients who contracted Hansen's disease or leprosy were isolated beginning in the 1860s. The report also provided a more targeted study of the cemeteries present on the peninsula, which are the focus of the talk today. Kalawapapa and Kalawao settlements are located on the northern coastline of Molokai on a low-lying peninsula of land that sits below the rest of the island at the base of a 3,000-foot sea cliff known as the Pali. The cliffs are some of the tallest in the world. The peninsula initially formed approximately 400,000 years ago because, because of a cataclysmic landslide set off by the East Molokai volcano. As a result, approximately one third of the island collapsed and slid into the sea. The landslide spread earth and rock underwater for nearly 100 miles northward. Later, between 230 and 300,000 years ago, a small nearshore volcano formed. When it later erupted, the resulting lava flow formed the Kalawapapa Peninsula as a geologically and topographically distinct entity from Molokai. This is the most dramatic picture I've ever seen on the right, which really shows how this landform kind of adheres to the island but is very separate from it. The peninsula is divided into three Oapu or land bays 
occupied by people for hundreds of years who fished and farmed and maintained dwellings and sites of spiritual importance on this land prior to the establishment of the Kalawapapa and Kalawao settlements. The peninsula today is also the site of Kalawapapa National Historical Park, established in 1980 by the US Congress as a unit of the national park system. The park was established to provide for the preservation of the unique nationally and internationally significant cultural, historic, educational, and scenic resources of the settlements. Kalawapapa National Historical Park honors the story of the isolated Hansen's disease community by preserving and interpreting its site and values, while also interpreting other aspects of the rich Hawaiian culture and traditions that extend for more than 800 years. At the time I worked on my study, the settlements remained home to a community of several patients and 80 helpers, most of whom were employees of the State of Hawaii Department of Health or the National Park Service. Sadly, I believe there are only one or two patients who live at Kalawapapa today. Like other units of the National Park System, Kalawapapa is open to the public. Special restrictions and parameters apply per the Department of Health rules govern governing visitation. Patients living at Kalawapapa have been integrally involved in managing the park since 1980. Our study looked at the various components of the peninsula cultural landscape, including elements of the Kalawao settlement along the eastern shoreline and the Kalawapapa settlement on the leeward or westward shoreline, the rough road that connects them, the Kalheiko crater that occupies the south central portion of the peninsula, the Pali Trail, the route used to travel between topside Molokai and the settlements since the 19th century that traverses the Pali Cliffs and a collection of 12 cemeteries along the Western shoreline, as well as several beach houses built by the patients, a small airport and a lighthouse. Those living at Kalawapapa today occupy portions of the Kalawapapa settlement, which contains numerous individual residents, residences and group homes, medical facilities, a community center, recreational facilities, three churches, and several administrative and maintenance buildings. Today at Kalawao, there are only two surviving building complexes, both associated with churches. Overall, within the peninsula, there are approximately 250 surviving buildings associated with the two settlements. The peninsula also features miles of paved and unpaved roads, plantings, gardens, fields, and utilities. Today, the only way to access the peninsula is by mule or by foot on the Pali Trail or by a small plane via landing strip at the north end of the peninsula, although barges also bring goods to the peninsula periodically. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of the settlements. It is not known when Hansen's disease or leprosy first arrived in Hawaii or how it arrived there. Referred to as the Chinese sickness, the disease was known to have occurred in China and may have come to Hawaii with seafarers visiting Honolulu Harbor after contracting the disease in another location where it was more widespread. Leprosy is thought to have been present in Hawaii at least as early as 1830. During the 1850s, King Kamehameha the third organized the first board of health at the advice of his privy council to protect the health of his people and to cure epidemic diseases such as cholera. In 1863, during the reign of King Kamehameha IV, William Hildebrand, the medical director of Queen's Hospital in Honolulu, brought attention to the disease, both to the public and the Legislative Assembly of Hawaii, which passed an act to prevent the spread of leprosy in 1865. The Board of Health then began exploring ways to secure or force isolation of people at risk of spreading the disease. The law required physicians or other persons with knowledge of a case of leprosy to report it to the proper authorities 
and also required the police to arrest affected persons and deliver them to the Board of Health for a medical examination and removal to a place of treatment or isolation. While a hospital was to be established to treat patients in the early phases of the disease and to attempt to find a cure, the Board of Health could send anyone considered incurable or capable of spreading the disease to a place of isolation. To provide for isolation and seclusion of affected persons, the government acquired the land of the Makanaloa Peninsula on the island of Molokai, which later came to be called the Kalawapapa Peninsula after the small village of Kalawapapa located on the leeward side of the peninsula. The peninsula was selected as a place to send Hawaiian residents who contracted Hansen's disease for its isolation from the rest of the world and for the difficulties that would be associated with leaving the site due to its being surrounded by water on three sides and 3,000 foot high cliffs on the fourth. Those presenting with Hansen's disease were quite forcibly relocated to the peninsula beginning in, the eight, in 1866. The first people were sent to the eastern side of the peninsula and the Kalawau Awapu due to the availability of freshwater sources. Early patients were assisted in addressing their needs for shelter and for food by those living on the peninsula and the knowledge they possessed regarding how to grow fruit, taro, potatoes, and other vegetables on the flat land and in the deep valleys located on the lower slopes of the Pali Cliffs where water often flowed. Although the government expected those sent to the peninsula to be self-sufficient, within a few years, it became evident that the patients were often too ill to care for themselves and too numerous for the available housing and food supply. By 1873, the Board of Health had established a hospital and a few other amenities to care for the patients, while religious organizations had established two churches the Congressional Siloama Church of the Healing Spring and St. Philomena Catholic Church to provide for the spiritual needs of the patients. The emerging small community edged a road that connected the site with the fishing village to the east at Kalawapapa. By 1873, there were over 800 patients at Kalawa settlement. A Catholic priest, Father Damien, who arrived that year, reported that conditions at the settlement were entirely inadequate and advocated for additional services and the immediate need for suitable housing from the government. The following year, a store providing basic supplies for the patients was built uh, across from the hospital on the south side of the road and west of the churches, creating a center for patient services at the settlement. Additional funds were appropriated beginning in 1874 when several more improvements were made. The hospital was enlarged to include 12 buildings arranged around a small open space. New buildings included dormitories and an office, a dispensary, storehouse, cookhouse, bathhouse, morgue, jail, and schoolhouse. The buildings were all single story structures and whitewashed, giving a relatively uniform character. The entire complex was enclosed by a picket fence. Water from the, one of the valleys was piped over 6,000 feet to provide, provide fresh water to the hospital. And nine faucets were added along the line to allow others living in the settlements to draw water for crops and livestock. Father Damien successfully advocated for many improvements to the community while caring for the spiritual needs of the patients. With his close contact and tireless efforts, Damien himself contracted the disease in 1884, later dying in 1889. He was buried in the St. Philomena Catholic Church churchyard. Although a memorial to Damien remains in the churchyard today, his remains were later exhumed in 1936 and moved back to his homeland in Belgium. Saint Damien was canonized as a saint in the Catholic Church in 2009, and a relic of Saint Damien was subsequently sent back to Kalawapapa and interred in his original resting place. Poor health conditions at Kalawao prompted the Board of Health 
to consider moving the settlement to the west side of the peninsula where there was more space for development, a better climate for the patients, and proximity to a boat landing that would facilitate the delivery of goods. A slow transfer of the community began as early as the 1870s, accelerated in the 1880s, and continued into the second decade of the 1900s. Although the physical structures and pa patient population were largely relocated to Kalawapapa by the mid 20th century, Residents and families continued to visit Kalawao, including the churches, which continued to be used to hold services. The settlement sprawled along Damien Road as well, which this map clearly shows um, the extent of the settlement um, in the, during this time. Historic photographs of those living in the settlements show the myriad activities that people enjoyed even as their lives were controlled to a great degree by the government and the separation from their loved ones and earlier lives. Many joined groups or clubs that enjoyed recreational pursuits, sporting competitions and performances. Others grew plants of interest for foods such as avocados, mangoes and bananas and for traditional craft to fashion lays and for medicinal needs. Groups and individuals hiked to spots of beauty for picnics and to coastal rocky areas where they collected salt from dry spray, dry spray pools. There were Boy Scout troops, a band shell for musical performances, swing sets for the children, and favorite swimming holes and fishing spots. Many religious orders maintained a presence at Kalawapapa to minister to the patients and to oversee the care of young people. You can see the nuns getting into the um, into fishing on the middle picture on the bottom. However, at the same time, there were constant reminders of the exiled condition under which the patients lived. Family members and others, other visitors were forced to meet with the patients in a special facility, which is shown in the top left, where a fence and a hedge separated the patients from their visitors and all direct contact. Medical and administrative staff were housed behind fences, such as the picture on the top right, that indicated where patients were not invited to go. A gatehouse, lower left, um, sat at the top of the Pali Trail to control who could come and go from the community. Patients worked to establish places where the government did not control all facets of life. Um, one of the things they did was to build beach houses along the shorelines, both on the west side and the east side, out of salvaged materials where medical personnel were not invited. The picture in the lower right is one of those beach houses. Um, another place where the patients uh, were in involved in self-governance is in their gardens behind their houses, um, which were considered private spaces and where people could enjoy parties and picnics, and um, one of their favorite occupations, which was gambling or playing cards. In 1946, sulfone drugs were discovered that worked to halt the progression and contagion of Hansen's disease. Although these drugs were found to be successful, the edict proclaiming that patients be sent into isolation was not rescinded until 1969. After 1969, patients were given the option of returning to society. Many, however, elected to remain in the place that had become home. The Department of Health has continued to care for the patients to this day. However, the number of patients has continually dwindled as no new patients have moved to the settlement and others have, have aged. As noted in 1980, a national park unit was established on the property. This is primarily a management situation as the Department of Health and other state agencies continue to own the vast majority of the land on the peninsula. The National Park Service has made it possible for visitors to travel to the peninsula um, with some of the patients overseeing businesses providing tours for visitors. Several of the churches continue to offer services today. A store sells provisions while the community center remains in use. That's shown on the bottom right. The store is the second from the left on the bottom. A church um, is the third from the right on the bottom. And 
the bottom uh, left are some of the mules or horses that came down the Pali Trail with visitors. Um, as possible, uh, the residences continue to serve patients, caregivers, and others. The patients have advocated for the removal of fences that came to symbolize separation so that the original visiting pavilion, which is the second from the left on the top, um, as well as um, some of the buildings that um, the administrators and medical staff formerly lived in, all of those fences have been removed. And the patients are extremely sensitive to fencing in general and um, do not encourage it to be used throughout the peninsula. Care of the large settlement area remains a daunting challenge that the National Park Service works to meet. And in some cases, as you can see, um, management of the proliferate, prolific vegetation um, threatens to overtake a lot of the facilities out there. And it's an ongoing challenge to keep everything in good condition. One of the most important features on the peninsula that connects us to the settlements and its residents are the cemeteries. It is believed that a large percentage of Hawaiians can trace a connection to a family member who lived at Kaluapapa, suggesting that these cemeteries may become an important place of pilgrimage for many. Overall, as shown on this aerial photograph, there are 20 cemeteries and burial grounds located throughout the peninsula. I'm just gonna talk a little bit about the history of the cemeteries. So the death toll from the complications caused by Hansen's disease and the poor living conditions within the settlement was staggering during the initial decades of the settlements. Early on, thousands of people were buried without formal services in unmarked graves. Many of these unmarked burials are at Kalawau in the open field, east of the St. Philomena Catholic Church. After the Siloama and St. Philomena churches were constructed in the 1870s, their churchyards became uh, the centers of, of burial grounds. By the late 19th century, designated cemeteries existed both at Kalawau and at Kalawapapa. The earliest grave markers associated with the West Coast cemeteries shown on the right at Kalawapapa indicate burial dates during the 1890s, particularly within the Catholic cemetery the adjacent Old Hawaiian and Americans of Japanese Ancestry Cemetery, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Saints Cemetery, and the CE Protestant Cemetery. In 1901, two resident benevolent societies were created to take care of graves in these sites and throughout the peninsula. Part of their work involved building fences to protect the graves from feral animals and roaming livestock that often disturbed the burials. The Board of Health maintained known burial sites without fences. By the 1930s, there were 12 individual cemeteries present along the Western coastline of the peninsula clustered into two groups, one with eight cemeteries and the other with four. The system extended for over a mile. Each cemetery was affiliated with a religious denomination or a cultural group. Grave markers often reflected cultural and ethnic traditions in sighting and orientation and in their design and use of materials. Each cemetery abutted the next. The cemeteries were variously bounded by rock fences, uh, wood fences and trees with species including ironwood, pine, date palms and halawakoa trees. Markers ranged from upright concrete headstones to concrete slabs flush with the ground, crosses of different materials, mausoleums, elevated tombs and vaults, obelisks, posts, haka or urn houses, and concrete slurry covered lava rocks configured in geometric forms. Some graves were marked with simple signs or crosses made of wood. Other materials used for grave markers included lava field stone, concrete, iron pipe, bronze plaques, granite, and marble. Patients often helped to fabricate the grave markers. On April 1st, 1946, as shown in the lower left photograph, a tsunami swept over the west coast of the peninsula, which had a significant impact on the settlement and the cemeteries along the shoreline. 
The waves changed the morphology of the shoreline and washed away or dislodged many headstones and damaged the fences and rock walls marking the boundaries between the cemetery. After the tsunami, uh, everyone worked to um, repair and replace the markers as possible. The cemeteries have continued to be used through the 1950s and 1960s and continue to be used today and will be the final burial site of all of the rest of the patients. In 1980, the National Park Service assumed responsibility for maintaining the cemeteries. Now I'm just gonna quickly talk about each of the cemeteries, uh, where they're located, what their character is. This map shows the overall um, organization of the cemeteries and the way that they're labeled with um, letters. I'm gonna start with the letter A um, and the cemeteries along the West Coast. Um, so this is part of the uh, collection, large collection of 12 cemeteries. This is the group of eight. Um, as shown, the cemeteries are organized by uh, into different groups or religious affiliations. Um, they're collectively known as the West Coast cemeteries. The um, cemeteries to the South are there are eight of them, and they are called the Papaloa Cemeteries. Papaloa means long, flat area, and they pretty much extend over a long uh, level area facing the coastline. Small contemporary wooden signs mark the divisions between each of the burial grounds. Um, they are also often distinguishable from one another by the arrangement, materials, and form of the grave markers. Um, Historically, they were uh, outlined with hedgerows, walls, and lines of trees, as I said, that were um, impacted by the tsunami. And they also used to be fenced to keep uh, out cattle, but those fences were removed in the 1980s. So cemeteries uh, A through H, as shown, um, represent Catholic, Hawaiian, American, Americans of Japanese ancestry, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and Protestant uh, affiliations. Further to the north are cemeteries J through N, uh, M, and these are the Iliopi cemeteries. Um, there are four total that represent religious affiliations or regions of origin, including Catholic, Americans of Japanese ancestry, Chinese, and Kahuan, I can't say it, <laughs> Hawaii, uh, oh, Hawaii. Um, one of the cemeteries, uh, Cemetery L, is enclosed by lava rock walls. Um, a single burial site is located um, at the Bishop Home for Girls. Um, it marks the final resting place of one of the most important religious figures in the history of the settlements, uh, Mother Marianne Cope. She um, was a member of the Franciscan Sisters of Charity who oversaw the, the home for girls. Uh, Cope arrived at Papa in 1888 and remained on site until her death in 1918. St. Marianne and the sisters who joined her implemented high standards of treatment and care for those diagnosed with Hansen's disease. When she died in 1918, Mother Marianne was buried on the grounds of the Bishop Home property within a formal arrangement of features, including a statuary monument. Residents of the settlement raised money for the monument, which was placed at the gravesite in 1919. In 2012, Mother Marianne was canonized and the gravesite continues to honor St. Marianne. Also located on the site of the Bishop Home for Girls are other grave markers uh, composed of piled lava rock, um, and these are of unknown origin. Uh, the crater that I described is located in the south central portion of the peninsula, um, which is just to the north of the road corridor connecting the two settlements, is surrounded by um, a couple of burial grounds. Uh, this is referred to as Cemetery N. Um, it follows the western rim of the crater, um, as well as an access road that leads to the, towards the crater from Damien Road. The graves are grouped into areas enclosed by rock wall enclosures. Several graves at the top of the rim are grouped together, but not enclosed by walls. 
The graves are thought to be associated with members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, who were one of the early religious groups that helped patients. Most grave markers are ledger style and cover the entire grave. Otherwise, the markers vary in form, scale, and materials. Several are comprised of stacked lava rock. Of these, some are covered with render and lime wash. Others range from elaborate tomb crypts or vaults up to four feet in height with subterranean interment um, to upright slabs made of granite, concrete with render and lime wash or marble. Uh, Cajaloco Cemetery is uh, one of, of great interest. Um, it was established to the south of Damien Road around 1887. Um, it may have been located on the site of an earlier graveyard because there are um, there is evidence of earlier grave markers. The cemetery is believed to have remained in use until 1920 or 1921, after which it was abandoned. Henry Law, Kalawa Papa Settlement's first superintendent, later planted Java plum trees to shade the cemetery. However, these trees, which are an incredibly invasive and challenging uh, tree to control, became so thick that this, the cemetery could no longer be seen. And uh, it, it fell out of um, memory. People didn't even uh, remember that it existed. It was rediscovered in the 1990s and work has been ongoing to clear the cemetery and protect the gravestones from the trees, uh, some of which have fallen on the grave markers. The final cluster of cemeteries is located at Kalawau, and it includes um, the cemeteries associated with both of the churches, as well as the two fields where it is believed most of the um, earliest people were buried uh, without any markers. Um, there are up to 8,000 graves on the um, peninsula, and of these probably about 1,500 are marked. Um, this is also the location of the memorial to St. Damien, which is shown in photograph on the bottom, uh, which is the upright marker with a lot of um, uh, materials that have been deposited by visitors. So moving on to um, some of the challenges associated with these cemeteries. Um, as you can see, the, the cemeteries range in age, um, materials, location, uh, as well, they also range um, in terms of preservation issues and needs. So our project entailed um, visiting all of the sites and recording all of the issues and trying to group those into categories that could be um, considered in terms of uh, preservation and repair maintenance protocols. So um, the in looking at the overall condition of the grave markers and other features in the cemeteries, they range from good to poor, depending on the age of the feature, its material construction and its location. Many of the grave markers have been repaired relatively recently. Um, the National Park Service has a, a, a crew that comes in and works on repair needs um, as much as possible. Um, work has been conducted in several cemeteries since the mid 2000s, specifically to address repair needs, including um, Cajaloco, where, which I mentioned earlier, that had been heavily impacted by the Java plum trees. Um, the efforts to repair the cemetery headstones and other, other issues um, have been well documented, and this information is being used to establish an adaptive management strategy so that repairs that work are carried forward, whereas repairs that um, may cause other problems are abandoned. So I'm gonna quickly talk about some of the repair issues that um, we observed uh, while in the field. Um, and I'll run through these relatively quickly. So these uh, photographs show um, examples of displacement of grave markers from soil movement, which sometimes includes subsidence where the soil starts to um, compact and change its, its elevation, um, settlement and erosion. Um, and then we also have examples of leaning or fallen grave markers, such as the one on the right. We have many examples of grave markers that exhibit biological growth, um, as well as soiling, where um, soil has maybe been splashed up onto the marker from during a rainstorm. 
Um, some of the markers exhibit uh, loss of inscription detail, which is particularly sad when we lose that information about who's, um, who was buried there. Um, we also find a lot of examples of deterioration of setting mortar, which leads to the collapse as shown on the right. We see a lot of examples of erosion and surface wear where water is moving across the ground and leading to bare patches. Um, we have examples of rising damp, which is where water from the ground starts to creep up onto the, to the masonry structure. And then we have examples of um, some of these flat uh, concrete markers where um, if the water doesn't shed to the sides, it will sit on the top and pond, which can be um, deteriorate, which can help deteriorate the concrete. We have many, many examples of cracking and chipping and broken markers. Um, some of these are, you know, more uh, far gone than others and present a, a variety of challenges for repair. We also see cracks and spalls from corrosion of embedding fer embedded ferrous material. So when you use iron to hold the, the concrete together, it can start to rust and that um, causes cracks and spalls. We also have the particular challenge in this location of uh, corrosion of concrete reinforcement due to airborne salt and sea spray. And again, we have many examples of collapsed vaults. Um, and one of the particular um, types of, of grave markers that we have here are these lava rock tombs that are encased within a lime wash um, and render. And so these uh, exhibit some cracking and some spalling um, and then uh, loss of the of the line wash coating. Um, and we also see, and this is, you know, when I was talking about the adaptive management strategy, we do see where previous repairs have been attempted and sometimes um, incorrectly match a mortar or attempt to um, rejoin pieces with an incompatible material. And so those that can lead to actually more problems um, that need to be corrected. Um, a lesser used material, but iron is present in the form of fences and actually some markers. And so that can become corroded. And sadly, I think um, one of the challenges is that where people used um, just plain wooden crosses, the wood is deteriorating um, exceptionally. And, and we have, I believe, lost quite a few of the uh, wood markers over the years. And then one of the challenges that um, is particularly of interest to the landscape architects um, is uh, how we deal with plant material. Um, so we have several problems, one being encroachment of tree groves um, along the coastline. There have been uh, plantings of iron ironwood pine, um, which is an invasive species that spreads aggressively. And that has started to grow into the cemeteries and has causes, caused some problems to the um, grave markers. We have other places where trees, um, other planted trees have caused problems such as the central one, which um, qu is quite a challenge. And then just the whole um, issue of mowing is, is a big challenge for maintaining uh, grave graveyards, burial grounds. In addition to all of the um, issues that we observed on site, we worked with the National Park Service to find out what some of their um, other challenges were that were not quite as apparent. Um, and so this is a list of the things that we were asked to consider in developing our cemetery management plan um, in addition to repair of grave markers. Um, and so, uh, as I mentioned with the tsunami, we lost um, a lot of grave markers and the actual locations of graves. And so, uh, we were asked to think about some strategies for identifying graves lacking grave markers. Um, we were asked to look at guidelines for future burials and how those should be marked so that they remained compatible with the historic character of the graveyards. Um, ideas for tree stewardship, for mowing and turf care, for maintaining historic views and view sheds, for introducing um, new signage and site furnishings, uh, for addressing accessibility and for interpretation. 
So following up on those um, items, I'm just gonna quickly talk about some of our findings and our recommendations and how we um, propose that the National Park Service might move forward with addressing some of these problems. And so um, first and foremost, we, we provided some recommendations for um, what, the, what the Park Service should do to protect in the in, um, inevitable or, or if, if there were uh, another tsunami or some other event that would lead to the loss of the cemeteries or the grave markers. And so we recommended that each and every cemetery be fully documented to protect against loss um, using all of our available toolkit of um, global positioning system, you know, locational information, photographs of the features, GPR technology, which is ground penetrating radar to make sure that we understood where burials were and to record all of this information in a way that it would protect the um, information of these cemeteries uh, should they be lost. Um, we also had a very a specific set of repair protocols, and we involved a materials conservator in that work so that each of those um, individual preservation needs and condition issues of concern were addressed with a series of, of protocols for repair. Um, and also we identified a prioritized strategy so that we would identify first the um, grave markers in the poorest condition and made those the first to be repaired. Um, we also made strong recommendations about who should be doing this work, that it be done by qualified and trained persons and be done using appropriate materials uh, to avoid additional examples of where an incompatible repair might lead to more problems later. Um, and in all cases, um, all of the recommendations were made with the understanding that um, any surviving patients and family members would be um, consulted and that it would be a collaborative process so that all voices would be heard um, before implementation began. We also thought it was really important to try to mark all the graves as possible. And so um, identified a process of involving um, local groups, park partners, anthropologists, archeologists, and other preservation professionals to locate unmarked graves. Um, this would also benefit from some of the tools we talked about earlier, the ground penetrating radar and other, and using historic maps um, to try to locate graves and then to mark those unobtrusively with the metal identif identification tag that could be relocated as needed. Um, we also recommended that the National Park Service work with family descendants to determine future burial locations. And um, this is specifically to those who um, have permission to be buried here in the future, which is generally patients and a few others who have been given permission. Um, at a certain point, the cemeteries will be closed uh, to future burials. But in the meantime, um, those that do occur need to be done in an appropriate manner. And so to develop the, the protocols um, was the purview of uh, the Park Service with family descendants. Uh, we also thought it was important to provide a grave locator to help visitors find specific family members or others, um, and that this should be an, located in an accessible place. Um, we talked about prohibiting um, the, uh, taking a of rubbings from grave markers, which can be can damage the grave markers. And we also um, uh, identified the need to establish a policy for managing the items left graveside. Um, as you can see at the Father Damien Memorial, um, people do come and leave quite a variety of things. And it's not just at his location, but at many of the graves. Um, and those items um, eventually will need to be you know, removed or, or put in some kind of storage or, or protected somewhere and to establish a policy for how long they stay and how they're cared for after they're removed. In terms of um, vegetation, 
we talked about um, just like recording the locations and information about every grave marker, um, recording the locations and species of all plantings so that they can be replaced in kind as needed um, so that it doesn't just become a big open field. Um, I think some of the tree plantings are an, a wonderful accompaniment to the, to the graveyards and our historic features. Um, we did want to make sure that any new plantings would be carefully cited so that they would not interfere with existing grave markers. So to place them at least 10 feet away. Uh, we also thought it was important to regularly evaluate every tree um, for any hazardous conditions that might lead to branches or trunks falling on and damaging the grave markers or any visitors. We also provided very careful um, protocols for the types of turf species that should be used um, to meet visual, physical, and environmental criteria that we established, um, and that they be kept mown to a certain height, but with the areas around the grave markers, trees and roads kept carefully trimmed. Um, to protect the grave markers from mowing, uh, we recommended that they equip mowers with rubber bumpers and ensure that the discharge guards are used to direct the trimmings away from the grave markers. And that um, when using string trimmers around the grave markers, that they use a lightweight nylon string rather than a metal core string, which can damage um, the grave markers. Uh, we also talked about um, probably maintaining the invasive species such as the iron wood pine and the java plum, but um, establishing sort of a no expansion line and preventing them from expanding further. Um, in looking at the views, uh, we have historic photographs that show that the coastline was um, much more open in the past. And so we've seen a proliferation of the ironwood pine trees, as you can see in the top right, um, they block the views between the cemetery and the, and the ocean. And so we recommended sort of a careful thinning approach that might be done slowly over time um, to reestablish views without completely removing all of the trees, uh, which may help to shelter the space um, and are also attractive as well. Um, in, in some of the cemeteries, the cow hope, Heiko Crater Cemetery and the Cajaloco Cemetery, we um, recommended removing um, invasives and reestablishing nat native plant communities as much as possible. We also recommended establishing a place where visitors could drive and park um, that's connected to a grave locator and interpretive information to increase accessibility because currently there's not really any place where people can go and visit the cemeteries. And then we also recommended guidelines for what new features like signage, parking, the grave locator and site furnishings might look like so that they're compatible with the historic character of the cemeteries and with each other. And finally, um, we developed a prioritized action item list that we provided um, in the report that established um, the need for an electronic repository for cemetery archival material that would include the repair protocols that would include any new research and information that's collected about the history of the cemeteries and who's buried there. We also recommended that um, the National Park Service draft and adopt all the cemetery procedures, policies and guidelines, including allowable activities, for new burials, types, materials, and styles for replacement and new grave markers, grave ornamentation, types of enclosures, and allowable plot covers, so that all of that was clear and easy to move um, forward with. Um, the next priority was to identify unmarked graves using evidence from historic photographs, remote sensing, LIDAR, and other techniques. Um, and then enhancing accessibility by identifying appropriate locations for parking spaces and a, providing a grave locator, um, providing interpretive materials for visitors so they can appreciate and understand the value, significance, and 
importance of these um, of these cemeteries. And then um, updating the inventory and assessment protocols for prioritized repairs and establishing protocols to be used by trained persons to repair and maintain the grave markers. And then to begin the vegetation management strategy um, implementation that was recommended in terms of tree plantings, tree care, turf care, and mowing. And that is pretty much the, um, the majority of what we provided. Um, it had a lot more detail, but um, in the um, interest of time, uh, I'm going to stop there and um, provide you all with um, an opportunity for questions and discussion. Um, and I'm ending with a couple of photographs of some artwork that was done by a former patient, Ed Cato, um, which is on site. And you can see these if you visit, visit Calo Papa today. Thank you very much, Liz. And we have several questions that have been put into the chat. So uh, one of them was, uh, you know, your early photo that you like so much, do you have a date for that photo? The first uh, historic photo? Yeah, I think that's around 1872. Okay. I, can, I can look it up, but I think I think it's around there. It's before 1873. What relic of St. Damien's was sent back to Kalapapa? Um, I believe it was a digit and I, I don't know, I can't remember if it was a finger or a toe. Okay. I think that's um, possibly online if, I'm sorry, I can't remember right now. <laughs> Do you know what the uh, peak population was of the settlements? Um, let's see, with 8,000 burials. Liz, your sound is, your sound is, oh. yeah, there. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I, yes. I don't, I don't know how many, um, you know, we, we uh, let's see, by the 1880s, there was 800 residents, and I think it continued to grow into the 1920s or 1930s, but I don't know what the, what the peak population was. Okay, we have a, a question on uh, the cemeteries. Are they on, primarily on dunes? Um, what uh, soil are they located on? Well, the um, obviously the Crater Cemetery is on, you know, that uh, volcanic soil, um, and Cahaloco is on a on a just a regular um, sort of upland soil. And I, I, yeah, the cemeteries on the west coast are pretty sandy. The soil is pretty sandy. Did Did you find any prehistoric, or have there been prehistoric burials that have been located on that peninsula? I, um, for the people that were living there, like up to 800 years, you know, before the settlements, um, we believe some of the burials at the crater, as well as the Cajaloco Cemetery, um, date farther back, and they have the traditional um, forms, and the, the burials, uh, the people are are in the crouching position of, of those early burials, early traditional burials, um, and I think there's there is evidence throughout the peninsula of, you know, of early cultural settlement use, um, including burials. Yeah. Uh, is the area impacted with uh, climate changes, especially that of oceanic warming and storms? I think climate change is going to be one of the greatest challenges. I think it's, um, Potentially, you know, sea level rise is going to impact those West Coast cemeteries, which is one of the things that we, why we felt so strongly about documenting all of those cemeteries carefully. We did talk about the possibility of establishing a living reef further out along the shoreline to protect the cemeteries as possible. Um, but I, I think that that, that will be 
a big challenge. And I also think it's um, contributing to the proliferation of the invasive species. Um, there's quite a quite a few invasive species out there that are problematic. Um, almost the entire peninsula is covered with um, with invasive species. That that's not where the cultural areas are maintained. So it's it's quite difficult to get around out there. Um, but yeah, I think sea level rise and uh, you know increasing storms frequency and severity um you know temperature increases uh changes in rainfall are definitely all going to impact what happens out there well, what is the elevation of those grave sites uh well the the west coast cemeteries are probably somewhere between 10 and 20 feet above sea level. And then the crater, I think, is um, up at a couple hundred feet. Uh, question, where where did the rounded vault designs come from? Um, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I don't know. I don't know. They're, you find them in a lot of locations. And I don't, that's one of the areas um, that's really interesting. We, we did read about um, later grave markers being brought over on the barges and those were mostly fabricated of, you know, finer materials like granite and marble. But all of the, um, the grave markers with the lava rock and the lime wash um, are older and they, they may occur in lots of places in, on the islands, but um, they're they're very prevalent out there, and I don't know if it's a unique design to to the site. I don't know. The uh, other question was, where did the cement come from? Um, was it in, or was it brought down from? They made their own cement, uh, so they must have gotten the materials that was brought brought in on the barges. But there were actually patients who established like a shop, and they actually made their own cement headstones or concrete headstones. Um, and, you know, that's really also a very interesting one thing that we learned from, from some of our interviews with people um, was that how, how many were actually made on site by the patients. Um, yeah, but they bring a lot of materials over on the barge. I mean, you wouldn't believe how many, there's cars and school buses and trucks and all kinds of equipment like that and um, houses have, you know, washing machines and refrigerators. So really um, there's a lot of, of things on the peninsula that come in on those barges, including the construction materials. But I think um, there's a couple of challenges. One is that it, it's hard for the boats to dock. They have to pick a certain type of time of year when there's less likelihood of, of um, storms. And then sometimes they can't actually dock. So the time between um, barges has increased um, because of the challenges associated with docking. Um, but yeah, they brought a lot of materials over on, on barges. I don't think the planes can bring in too much besides food. How much of the funding is uh, allocated towards tombstones? You mean the Park Service funding? Is I there a dedicated budget for that? They have established a program for maintaining the, the headstones, the grave markers. And um, I was talking to Andrea about this earlier. I, you know, I think that federal funding, you know, varies a lot depending on, you know, congressional allocations. And I don't know that it's a standard or regularized stream of funding. And so they try to establish kind of a cyclical maintenance need that they can, you know, get funding for, but I, I'm not sure it always comes through the way it needs to. So. Andrea, just uh, tell me when you need me to have the last question. Um, I think, gosh, there's so many questions I wish we could go on, but I think <laughs> in the name of being respectful of time for um, Liz, yourself, and everyone who's here, let's take one more question and then we'll see if there's some that haven't been addressed. Um, we'll see if there's a way to respond, can't promise, but maybe we'll, we'll see if there's a way to respond to that in writing on the webpage later. Liz is shaking her head, so. Sure, okay, yeah. thank you, the interest is amazing. Go ahead, um, Dr. Kemp. 
I, I'm trying to figure out which one. <laughs> <laughs> how how far did the tsunami reach? The forty six tsunami. Well, it definitely impacted the settlement in inboard. So it, it definitely swept all the way across the cemeteries, but I it um it impacted um uh, yeah portions of the settlement probably to you know where the community center is. Um I mean there are there's not many photographs unfortunately. Um that's a rare one that I found of the cemeteries, but um there are reports that it was it was really devastating. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Kim, please, I think you probably want to jump in before I close up. Did you want to say anything? <laughs> uh, just, just thank you to all the people that have been attending the lecture series. Uh, we're so appreciative of the questions and the comments and your support overall for this expert series. Thank you, Dr. Kim. I echo your words. I want to definitely thank um, thank Liz again for this really extraordinary and, and very well researched and experienced presentation that you gave. And I want to thank everyone, as Dr. Kim said, for attending the series and your interest. Um, we really hope you enjoyed the presentation. I want to thank all our past speakers and I definitely want to thank Michelle Kisick, my colleague, for helping and always being a rock behind the scenes. Um, I want to thank everyone for their engagement on these topics and ask you when you sign off, if you would be so kind as to take the survey. This helps us produce future educational programming. Your opinions are definitely read and they matter. And thank you too to engage with us. Please sign up if you haven't yet already for our e-newsletter on historichawaii.org. And if you'd like to support our organization, the Historic Hawaii Foundation, you can do so at on our website at join us in the join us section. Um, if you do sign up for the e-news, we'll be sharing news and events and future programming, which is in the process of being developed right now. And mahalo nui loi to everyone for today. Ahui ho until we see you again. And thank you for caring about Hawaii's historic places and sharing them and loving them. Ahui ho.